Tourlu, and I design workshops that help young people explore science and creativity together in one big melting pot. Um, my workshops are about loads of different kinds of science and life all around us, because let's face it, science kind of has an impact on almost everything that we do and can see around us. The topic of science that I want to explore with you guys today is mini beasts or the teeny tiny minuscule creatures that make up an enormous amount of the living things on earth. 97% in fact. Can you imagine that? How mind blowing. 97% of the living things on planet earth are mini beasts, which means that all of the other animals, plants, trees, you name it, every other creature on earth, including ourselves, only accounts for 3%, which means that no matter where you are watching this workshop and taking part, I can guarantee you that if you step outside your back door, you will discover some mini beasts living there because they're everywhere and there are an enormous number of them. We're going to talk about the vast range of mini beasts that you'd be able to find right in your own back garden, whether that's in the city or the suburbs or the countryside, which is where I live, even near the seashore. There's a huge variety of life to be found right in your own back garden. So once we've learned a thing or two about mini beasts, we're going to make some projects, some really fun, hands-on, crafted projects that are going to help you find mini beasts in your back garden, explore them further and get to know a little bit more about them, and also just have fun making something with your hands that's interesting to use and creative, which is a really lovely way to kind of unwind and do something a bit different. So I'm going to guide you through those projects. I'm also going to give you guys a printable so that you can watch the video which explains the different projects that you can make, but you can also print out a handy worksheet that tells you step by step just how to go about it. And there'll be some other printables too that you can take out into your garden or green space in front of your house or maybe some woods nearby um, to go on your very own hunt and see just how many of the mini beasts on my list you can find living near you. So let's get started by learning just what exactly is a mini beast. So mini beasts are small creatures, snails, worms, insects, and spiders. And the scientific name for them is invertebrates or creatures without a backbone. Because mini beasts don't have a backbone, they usually have another form of structure that provides their body with support, but also protects them. So snails have shells. And then a lot of insects and spiders have something called an exoskeleton, which means a hard casing or shell on the outside of their body. Though it's hard to pinpoint the exact number, scientists estimate that there are approximately 25,000 different species of mini beasts living right here in Ireland. I want to share with you my top 10 facts about mini beasts or invertebrates. The first one I told you about in my introduction, which is that mini beasts or invertebrates account for 97% of the living things on earth which is an absolutely astounding number in my opinion. Another really interesting thing about them, they're an excellent source of protein, which means that as a food source, they're incredibly important, not only for other mini beasts or other insects uh, and birds, but actually for humans as well. In lots of different countries around the world, insects are actually a really typical and popular food to snack on. Deep fried crickets, for example, I'm told are really popular in Thailand. That might not sound particularly appealing to you, but the planet is changing all of the time. We might just come to rely on mini beasts as a source of protein in our diets in the future. That's kind of gross. So let's move on. My third fact has to do with the color and appearance of mini beasts. They are incredibly good at camouflage. Because mini beasts tend to be the prey 
of a huge number of other animals, either bigger mini beasts or birds. They have to be able to hide in plain sight. So the fact that their shells or their skin or their color is very similar to the environment in which they call home or their habitat means that they're able to go about their business, finding food, building shelters and so on, without being really easily spotted by predators. A really nice example of this is the wood louse. And I have an extraordinary piece of art of a wood louse. This was made by an artist named Libby Slater. You can see that its shell or its exoskeleton is pretty much exactly the color of the ground, dirt, stones, and so on. So it would blend into a field or a lawn or a garden bed very, very easily and not be spotted by birds or bigger insects that might want to eat it. Here's fact number four. Most mini beasts use their senses of smell, touch, and taste to explore the world around them because their sight and hearing is not particularly strong. And oftentimes they explore through touch and smell using antenna of the hairs on their body in order to do this. Fact number five, we as humans are incredibly reliant on mini beasts for the survival of our very own species. Might sound strange. I mean, they're tiny. What on earth do we need them for? But mini beasts do something incredibly important. They recycle dead matter. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? But mini beasts often eat dead matter. That could be something like rotting leaves or other foliage that's on the ground, the soil itself, which they break up and aerate, which is amazing for growing crops. And sometimes they even eat other dead mini beasts or even larger dead animals. But it's a really important thing to keep the health of our environment sustained. And it all comes back to something called biodiversity, which I'm sure you've learned about. Biodiversity refers to the huge variety of living things on Earth and the fact that our biodiversity is kind of like a puzzle with many different parts that all fit together to form a whole. If, and if any one of those pieces were to come unhinged or to suddenly disappear with the extinction of a species, for example, or the extinction of thousands of species of mini beasts, seeing as there are so many, that puzzle just wouldn't fit together properly anymore. And in an enormous chain of events, we would begin to see sometimes catastrophic, or at the very least, colossal changes in our environment and the health of our planet if all elements of the food chain and our biodiversity aren't maintained and kept healthy. Other ways that many beasts help keep our planet healthy are by pollinating plants, is incredibly important. The vast majority of plants on the planet get pollinated by mini beasts, like bees, but also butterflies. And if it weren't for bees and butterflies and other insects pollinating our flowers and our plants, our ability to grow food sources would diminish incredibly quickly. By carrying out the job of pollinating plants, bees make sure that we have a huge variety of different foods to eat. Things like apples and strawberries, pumpkins and beans. Humans aren't able to pollinate all of the crops that we require, particularly on a global scale, in order to provide enough food for everyone. So without pollinating mini beasts, we would be doomed to a life of an incredibly limited diet we begin to see extraordinary negative effects around the entire planet. And last but not least, mini beasts are a really important source of food in our ecosystem. The food chain, they're right down at the bottom, but without them, a huge number of creatures would never be able to survive life in the wild. They rely on mini beasts as a source of food in order to continue living. So fact number six, there are mini beasts at the seaside as well. So we'll talk about some of the ones that live in our back garden. But if you do live somewhere near the shoreline, 
or are able to go explore the shoreline sometime in the not too distant future, I hope, you might find mini beasts such as crabs or cockles, mussels, jellyfish, which you can sometimes see washing up on the beach, as well as corals and starfish, which you probably need to go exploring underwater in order to spot. Fact number seven. Mini beasts provide products that we as humans use. Bees create honey, but not just honey, they also provide wax, which is used for a huge array of things. Wax is used for a huge variety of things, from beauty products to candles to polish for wood. We also get silk from a mini beast, the silkworm, which goes into the creation of a huge number of garments and different fabrics that are used throughout the entire world. And then some mini beasts create pigments or colors that are used for things like cosmetics, but also food coloring that comes from a secretion in the mini beast's shell. Okay, fact number eight. Mini beasts, because there's a huge amount of them, make their homes or habitats in a wide variety of places. So things like under logs or stones, in the soil, underneath leaves, but then sometimes within ponds and trees, the grass, and along the seashore, or even in the sea. Fact number nine. Mini beasts eat a huge range of different things, from plants and the nectar that comes from flowers on plants, to other mini beasts. Not very pleasant to think about, but it's true. And finally, fact number ten. Invertebrates, or mini-beasts, have been alive on the planet for over 550 million years. Extraordinary. Dragonflies have been alive since the time of the dinosaurs. Now that we've learned a lot of facts about mini-beasts, let's talk about the variety of different types of mini-beasts that you might be able to find if you go outside. Some of the most common mini beasts in Ireland include the following caterpillars, the blue bottle fly, the slug, ladybird, monarch butterfly, earthworm, the hunting spider, the millipede, a hornet, and snails. One of the things that I've included as a printable worksheet for this workshop is an illustrated guide to tracking just how many of those mini beasts you're able to find in your own back garden. So you can print it out, take it outside, and then tick them off one by one to see just how many of that big long list actually calls your back garden home. Because there's such a huge number of mini beasts living on the planet and living right here in Ireland, I can pretty much guarantee that if you go outside, you will spot some. It might take you a little bit of time, but it shouldn't take you too long because they're literally everywhere. They can and do live in pretty much every habitat on the planet. But what might be a fun thing to do is to build a little trap to catch some mini beasts. You leave it outside overnight and when you come back the next morning, you will be guaranteed to have at least one mini beast, if not more, in your little trap, alive and with a source of food, because we're not going to harm the mini beasts. We're just going to contain them in a small space for a short period of time so we can observe them and check them out for a bit before, of course, and this is the most important thing, releasing them back into their natural habitat. And it's really, really simple to build a small trap to catch some mini beasts. I'm going to show you what to do. So basically you need a small container. You could use a yogurt pot or another kind of small cup. Something made out of clear plastic would be ideal so that you can look right into your trap to observe your mini beast once you have them. But if it's a yogurt pot that's not transparent, you can still just observe them from the top. So any kind of small container will, will do. 
This is the bottom of a bottle of apple juice that I just took out of my recycling bin and I cut the top off of it to make a tiny little pot. And step one is really important. We're going to make three or four small holes in the bottom of our mini beast trap. And that, as I said, is really important. The reason is that if it rains overnight, after you've trapped some mini beasts, you don't want your container to fill up with water, causing your mini beasts to drown, because we're trying our very best to do no harm whatsoever to our mini beasts. So I'm gonna take a pair of scissors. This might be kind of tricky, you might want to ask a grown-up to help you, depending on how old you are, but just be very careful as you poke with either a knife or a pair of scissors four little holes into the bottom of your container so that your mini beasts won't drown if it gets some water inside. So, as you can see, I've just bored three little holes into the bottom of my container. It wasn't easy to do, so depending on the thickness of the plastic container that you're using, I definitely guarantee asking a grown-up to help with just this one part. Now, may, having made sure that my mini beast trap is not going to bring any harm to the creatures that I have in there, I need to bring it outside. Because what we're going to do is bury this little container into some ground. So we want it to be right in line with the ground level. The soil on either side should be at exactly the height of the top of the container. So I need to dig a hole the very size of my container so that I can place it down inside and the soil is all around it. So you can pick any place in your garden or a space outside of your house. If you have a garden bed, where, you're grown, where the grown-ups in your house don't mind you digging, or maybe a tiny little corner of the lawn, under a tree, or some shrubs, wherever you decide. I would recommend maybe moving it a little bit farther away from your house than just outside the back door. Kind of a quiet spot off in a corner somewhere would be perfect. So, off you go and dig a hole. And if you like, you could actually make a couple different traps, depending on how many different plastic containers you have in your recycling bin. Because the bait that we're going to put inside the trap to attract a mini beast into it is going to be different depending on the type of mini beast you're trying to catch. So some mini beasts are carnivores. They eat meat and will be attracted to a tiny piece of meat, maybe just a bite-sized smidgen of meat left over from somebody's lunch or dinner. Other mini beasts are herbivores. So they would be attracted to a tiny little piece of fruit, like maybe a slice of apple cut in half, or a tiny little segment of clementine or orange. You can drop your bait into your container. So if you've got more than one, you could put meat in one of them and fruit in another. And they're going to attract different types of mini beasts. Once your mini beast is in the hole in the ground, what you're going to do is place some rocks all around the top of your container. And I'll take a picture outside when I've done this in my own garden. But what we're doing is creating a kind of resting space on the ground around it so that when we place a piece of cardboard, which is one more thing you can find in your recycling bit and cut to fit just a little bit bigger than the top of your mini beast trap. Once your mini beast trap is in place with four little stones around it, when you rest your cardboard lid on top, it's not gonna close the door on the trap. It's going to leave just a tiny bit of space between the ground level and the cardboard for your mini beast to crawl inside, attracted by the bait you've dropped in, and then get stuck inside. And the cardboard is there for a really important reason. Once your mini beast has fallen down or climbed down into your trap, we wanna make sure that bigger mini beasts or larger insects or creatures don't come along and feast on it in the night. So, so once your cardboard is in place with that little bit of space created by the rocks, you're gonna place a much bigger rock on top to make sure that the cardboard doesn't blow away overnight, but your trap and the mini beasts that are going to end up inside is safely protected from bigger predators. 
So I've just come out into my back garden and I'm crouching in front of a raised vegetable bed. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. I'm just about to bury my mini beast trap in the ground here. But sitting next to my vegetable bed is a tiny little plastic garden pot, the type of thing that plants come in when you buy them from a garden center. And if the grown-ups in your house have any of these lying around that aren't in use, they would be ideal. You can't see through them, so you'll have to observe your mini beast from above, but they come with ready-made holes, which takes out the step of having to put holes into a plastic container. So they'd be really handy to use if you have them. So I have my mini beast trap that I made inside with the holes in the bottom. I'm gonna try to catch some herbivore mini beasts. So I've got a tiny piece of pear that I'm going to drop inside. And I've used a little hand trowel to dig a hole in my vegetable bed so that I can place my mini beast trap fully surrounded by soil in a place where I am sure there are already thousands of mini beasts living. And I'm just going to put the lid on top. It'll show you how I'm doing that. So here's my raised bed. It's a big old pl uh, metal tub that I turned into a vegetable bed for growing things like carrots. What I've done is just used a hand trowel to dig a hole so that my mini beast trap can slide right down inside and is fully surrounded by soil. That is going to enable me to place some rocks around four corners of the trap to create that tiny bit of separation between the top of the mini beast trap and my piece of cardboard, which is now going to go on top. So there's just enough space underneath for my mini beast to come along through the soil and head down into my trap, attracted by that piece of pear. Then I'm going to put a much bigger stone on top, which makes sure that a bird or a bigger insect can't come along and feast on my mini beast before I get here tomorrow morning to open up my trap and see what kind of creatures I have managed to catch. So tomorrow morning when I come back outside, I'm going to check my trap first thing. And I'm hoping that there will be some really cool mini beasts that have decided to come in and sample that little bit of pear. And when I find them, I'm going to bring it inside carefully and looking after it. I'm going to spend a little bit of time observing the mini beast to see what it is. Check the pictures that I'm going to provide you guys to identify the species. I might take a picture of it, just as a memento of the mini beast that was in my back garden. And then I'm going to use it as inspiration to create a really cool art project, which I'm going to show you guys next. Once I finish doing those things, I'm going to bring the mini beast right back outside to where he came from. Back into my vegetable bed so he can go back into his habitat and continue doing all those wonderful things like eating dead matter and pollinating plants and providing a food source for other creatures that make mini beasts such an incredibly important part of our biodiversity. So once you've used your mini beast trap to actually catch some of the mini beasts that live in your back garden, we're going to observe them, take a really close look at them and how maybe their shell is formed, the colors that they have, the shape and size um, of them, whatever they might be, whether it's a spider or a snail, a fly or a bee, although they're probably still hibernating. Um, you're going to really use your eyes to take a very, very detailed and close look at the mini beast that you found in order to use it as inspiration to make a really cool art project that you can put on display in your room or stick onto the fridge. Now, if you didn't trap mini beasts or you just want to get started on the art project before you've actually trapped anything, that's no bother. You can absolutely do that. You can use the printable of the mini beast detective sheet that I've provided as a printable and use it as inspiration for creating your art project. Or you can go online and look up some of the different mini beasts that we have talked about. And what we're going to be creating is basically a display of mini beasts in a box, or as I like to call it, 
a bug museum or a mini beast museum if you prefer. And this is one that my nine-year-old made. Now, we talked about camouflage and mini beasts and how they don't have really bright colors so that they're not really visible to predators. My nine-year-old didn't do it that way. But you know what? This is an art project. If you want to create pictures of mini beasts that look just like the real thing, like this artist's incredible etching of a woodlouse, by all means do that. But if you like your art to be vibrant and colorful, do what Sam did and use all the colors of the rainbow to make really wild and wonderful mini beasts. It's entirely up to you because art is what you want to make. So in order to make your bug museum, you're just gonna need a few simple things. And again, we're gonna raid the recycling box because it is my favorite place to find art materials. Sam's one used the lid of a shoe box in order to create the display box for his bug museum. So you might want to see if you can find the lid of a shoe box or the lid of any kind of box, really. If you can't, a plain old piece of cardboard will work just fine to mount all of your different mini beasts onto. If you want to create a kind of box-like display, such as this one, you could start with a plain piece of cardboard, but then fold down the edges, fold down the edges in order to make a box. And your mini beast museum can be whatever size you want it to be. It can be dictated by the size of the lid that you can get your hands on or the size of the cardboard. Maybe you just want one single mini beast on display so you can have a tiny little box. It's entirely up to you. I'm hoping that everybody's art creation is gonna be different because that's what art is all about. Um, so what you're going to do is start with a piece of cardboard or a lid you can just leave it plain if you want to. Plain old brown cardboard or white cardboard, whatever it might be is fine. But if you want a really colorful background, you can paint it the way that Sam did here. So he wanted a really bright, vibrant blue to offset all of his mini beast drawings. Um, so you, if you've got some paint lying around, you can paint your cardboard. If you don't have paint, that's totally fine. You might just have some colored paper that you can use to, to glue to the back of the lid or to your piece of cardboard in order to make it colorful. The next thing that you're going to need for your Mini Beast Museum is some paper or some card. I like using card, it's a slightly thicker type of paper because it means that when I cut out around things like antennas and feet, they're still strong enough not to fall apart, like this one here or um, you know, it just makes the paper a little bit stronger to work with. But if you don't have card, a plain old piece of white paper will work just fine. And then last but not least, you just need some drawing materials. So whether you wanna use twistables or pencil crayons or markers is entirely up to you. And what you're going to do is draw a series of mini beasts. Maybe the ones that you have in your own back garden. It might be the ones that you caught in your trap. Or it might be mini beasts that you wish you had in your back garden, but you've never actually seen there, like say a dragonfly or a monarch butterfly. You're going to draw your mini beasts onto the piece of card or paper, cut them out, and then put them on display, just like this one here. So I hope you really enjoy making that art project. It's a lot of fun. It might take a bit of time, but it's kind of a nice thing to do, maybe with some music going in the background. Just kind of forget about everything else while you're sitting and coloring and being creative. And at the end of the day, you'll have a really beautiful, interesting thing to put on display for you and all of the other people in your house to enjoy. So one of my absolute favorite mini beasts, I have to say, is the snail. I think they're lovely. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because they carry their house on their back. And I just think that's really kind of fascinating. Um, I love the way that when you find a snail in the garden, if you ever so gently touch its nose, they pull themselves straight back in. I love their antenna because I think they're incredible and I love watching them retract their antenna if you touch them. And inspired by the humble snail, our final project is going to make something that snails are very good at creating. And that is slime. Now, 
Word of warning, if you're going to make slime in your kitchen, you must, absolutely must ask a grown-up for permission. And there might be a few things on the ingredients list that you don't have in your house. So you would have to very kindly ask someone to get them for you. It's a very inexpensive recipe and it's absolutely foolproof slime recipe. So if you've ever looked up recipes online and they didn't quite turn out the way that you expected them to, I promise, the Toodaloo slime recipe is tried and tested. I have made it literally hundreds of times and it's turned out great every time. So I'm going to give you my super secret slime recipe as another one of the printables and you can try that out having a great time in the kitchen making it. It's really fun. It's kind of messy as you're making it but then once it's complete, it's not really messy at all. It's just really lovely and gooey and stretchy. And while it's not exactly the same as the slime that a snail makes and produces and leaves a trail of as it moves across the ground, it's a really fun thing to make and I hope you enjoy it. So that brings our mini beast workshop to a close. I hope you really enjoyed making the three projects and learning a little thing or two about mini beasts. And there is a world more to explore when it comes to mini beasts. I'm going to provide some links to websites that share all sorts of additional amazing facts about them and allow you to kind of deep dive into the subject if you found this really interesting and you want to learn more. I'll also suggest some really amazing books that you might be able to find at the library that can teach you more about mini beasts. And before we go, I'm going to leave you with three final fascinating facts. Number one, comma caterpillars are really good at camouflage. They disguise themselves to protect themselves from predators. But you know what they disguise themselves as? Bird poo. Ew. Funny fact number two, slugs have four noses. Also, ew. And last but not least, earthworms can have as many as 10 hearts. Absolutely extraordinary. So that's it from me, Lindsay from Toodaloo. Thanks so much for taking part. It was wonderful to put together this little workshop for you. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you keep being creative and learning about the world all around us. Take care. Thank you.